السلام عليكم يا رجوان بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منهم زوجها وبث منهما رجال كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم ركيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وكونوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم من يتي الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters All thanks and praise belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we seek Allah's help and His forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah from the evil within ourselves and from the consequences of our evil deeds. And whosoever Allah guides will never be led astray. And whosoever Allah leads astray will never find guidance. And I bear witness that there is no God but Allah alone without any partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad وسلم, is his servant and his messenger. My dear brothers and sisters, Alhamdulillah, I am very grateful to be here once again to reflect with you on the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And today I'd like to share with you some reflections on one of these Asma'ul Husna. And today I'd like to talk to you about al jami And al jami means the uniter. So as I previously discussed, there are 81 attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we find directly mentioned in the Quran. The other 18 Asma'ul Husna, they vary by scholar just slightly. This attribute, al jami is one of the 18 attributes. And we find... Uh, this in the list by Ghazali, and that's the list that I've been using all along. And the root words of al jami are jim, mim, and ayn, or jama, which means bring something together. So for example, it's used as, as a verb as um, una, they accumulate, or yajma'u, will gather. Uh, also as a noun, ajma'una, altogether. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who unites similar and dissimilar things, as well as opposite things. So as people, we see examples of this every day. We are, in fact, an example of dissimilar things combined together to make one unique thing. You know, there are people with different languages, different skin color, different cultures, etc. And yet, we all gather together to do work, to do play. And we do this together as one single community or one single ummah, or the human race. And if we look at our human form, all these different bones, the muscles, the tendons, the skin, the veins and organs and so on and so forth, all of these unite to give us form and abilities that allow us to survive on this earth. And if you look all around us, we find dissimilar things that are working together in unity. So if we see, for example, the rising of the sun and then followed by the setting of the moon and vice versa, or the oxygen that we breathe. You know, this wouldn't have been possible without the systems that are powered by the sun, by the plants, the minerals in the ground, and the air that make up this atmosphere, so that this way we can all sustain ourselves, breathe that same air. And the animals around us are examples of dissimilar species, you know, depending on one another for these sustenance. So you've got predators, you've got animals that only eat plants, and they all together form what we call broadly the circle of life. So it's not just animals depending on other creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We depend on other creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for our own nourishments, whether it's the plants, whether it's the fruits that we find or the uh, meat from other animals. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, for example, cattle so that we can provide or we can enjoy milk from these cattle. And we know this from Surah an nahl in the Quran. And Allah says, and there's certainly a lesson for you in cattle. We give you to drink of what is in their bellies from between digested food and blood. Pure milk, pleasant to drink. And this verse in Surah al nahl is a reminder for us that who else could create such complexities in the universe if not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Uh, you know, with all, the, with all the science that is around us, we understand even more of Allah's creations. But how, does, how did all of that come into existence? And that is the miracle and the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, bringing all of this together to create the kinds of systems that sustain us. 
And in Surah Al-Baqarah verse 117, we are told that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Badius Samawati wal Ard. He is the originator of the heavens and the earth. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees a matter, whether it's small or large, doesn't matter. All Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, kun, be. Kun fayakun, be, and it is. And when was the last time you paid attention to your fingertips, for example? So if you lift your hands up and examine your fingertips, you will notice that in your fingertips, there are these patterns. And these patterns are unique to you and me. So talking about dissimilar things, these fingerprint patterns are about as dissimilar as they can be from one another. And these fingerprints are unique for all 10 of our fingers. And we learn from scientists and people who study fingerprints that even identical twins, so if you look at two people and they're exactly identical in every visible way, they will have unique fingerprints. SubhanAllah, I mean, think about that. Two people look identical, yet have uniquely different fingerprints. And these fingerprints, they don't grow over time. We're actually born with these things. So as our body grows from baby to adult, these fingerprints adjust with our body over time. And yet they remain unique to us. And not just to us, but also in the rest of the world. And with the evolution of modern technology, you know, we tend to even use these fingerprints to protect our personal data, protect uh, our personal lives stored in these machines, these laptops, these smartphones, and so on. And we can use fingerprints to unlock doors even. So if you think about fingerprints, they are in a way a key to our personal lives. Now think about that. Almost 8 billion people living in this planet. What do you think are the chances that we will find two human beings that share the same fingerprints? Now this is where science comes in and math comes in and helps us understand you know, the, just how unique and how wonderful um, this feature is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. So according to the Scientific American, which is America's or the United States oldest continually published magazine since 1845, one in 64 trillion, think about that number, one in 64 trillion are your chances of sharing exactly the same fingerprints on your hands with some other human being on the planet. We haven't even reached 10 billion people on the planet yet, let alone 1 trillion people or even 64 trillion people. So suffice it to say that the likelihood of having two people or finding two people with the same fingerprints is infinitely small. I mean, ponder on that for a second. How beautiful is that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created all this, uh, all these different things, these dissimilar things, yet Allah is able to unite all of these things and allow us to then put these different things to use. You know, we have the same general formula as a human being, you know, we've got certain muscles, we've got certain features and certain capabilities, our bone structures, our organs, our physical traits and characteristics. And Allah reminds us in the Quran that it is not our looks, no matter how beautiful or how horrible we might think our looks are, it is not our looks that will um, be used to judge us on the day of judgment. It will be our actions. And in Surah At-Tur, verse 21, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Kullum ri'im bima kasaba rahinum. Every person will reap only what they sowed. So on the day of judgment, you know, our limbs and organs, we are told in the Quran, will bear witness against us. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask for our deeds or ask us about our deeds, we're not going to be speaking. Our organs and our limbs will testify for us uh, on that day. And then what will they say about us on that day? You know, that is something that Allah reminds us to think about on the Day of Judgment. So on Fridays, we're told, you know, read Surah Al-Kahf. And in Surah Al-Kahf, we're told that there will be four things that we will ask about on the Day of Judgment. So the Day of Judgment is when we will be asked about our deeds, but Allah already knows our deeds. We know this also from the Quran. So the Day of Resurrection, which is another name for the Day of Judgment, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring us all together, bring us all to life. And we know that when um, the angel will blow the horn on that day, everything will be demolished, everything will be dead. And then the horn will be blown the second time, and then everyone will be brought back to life. And on that day, among all of our organs, everything will be resurrected, including our fingertips. And that is easy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-jamid, the uniter, 
all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to say is kun fayakun, be and it is. And knowing that our limbs will bear witness against us, consider spending the remainder of today paying attention to where your fingers go. What do they do? What do they touch? And as you pay attention, ask yourself, is my, are my fingers engaged in something that is halal or haram? And if it is haram, then ask Allah for his mercy. For Allah is the most forgiving, most beneficent. And if it is halal, then thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving you the tools to engage in acts that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the Quran, in Surah Al-An'am, Allah tells us, whoever comes with a good deed will be rewarded tenfold, but whoever comes with a bad deed will be punished for only one. None will be wrong. And this verse is a reminder for us that every good action we do, every good deed we do, whatever it's worth is in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are rewarded for it ten times more. And any bad deed we commit, whatever it's worth is in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're only punished for what it is worth. And if you think about this in terms of an investment, you know, everybody talks about their retirement account, their 401k, their holdings and assets. If we think about this in terms of those kinds of investments that we make in this world, and then compare it to the investment guarantees that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us, which is 10x, there is no better investment in this world. No index fund, no mutual fund, no ETF, no stock, nothing that can give us that kind of return unless it's some kind of a Ponzi scheme. And, and we know how those go. So just reflecting on that for a moment, you know, all these returns accumulate for us over our lifetime. And if we perform actions that give us perpetual sadaqa, and we call these sadaqa jariya. So one example of sadaqa jariya would be um, donating to the construction of a mosque, for instance. So every time somebody goes and prays within that mosque, you're benefiting uh, from the rewards of that. Or if you create something that other people read, like, for example, a, a translation of the Quran or a small booklet that talks about how to read the Quran, you're also benefiting from that effort that is exerted by somebody who is reading and learning from this material. So Sadaqa Jariya is something that we benefit from even after we die. So in a way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this system for us that unites our actions in this life and in death. So all these examples around us, the signs from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are all around us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us that Allah is able to unite the living and the dead in so many different ways. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to unite all these different things in this world in so many different ways. And in Surah Al Imran, Allah tells us, indeed in the creation of the heavens and the earth and the alteration of the day and night, there are signs for people who reason. And there are those who remember Allah while standing sitting and lying on their sides and reflect on the creation of the heavens and the earth and pray, our Lord, you have not created all of this without purpose. Glory be to you. Protect us from the torment of the fire. And that's from Surah Al-Imran, verses 190 and 191. So how can we begin to benefit from this attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And that should be the purpose for us to learn from every single one of these uh, as small person, every one of these names, we should we should try to take away how can we take this and apply it into our lives. Now, as people, you know, one of the things that we suffer uh, quite seriously from, in my opinion, is arrogance. That is inside of all of us. So, how can we then be like Al Jami, the United? If that is, if arrogance is within us and that causes us to hold us back from actually being more like the qualities that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala wants us to to absorb. So Imam al-Ghazali gives us good advice. Imam al-Ghazali says, the one who unites uh, is one in whom knowledge is perfect and behavior is admirable. So this is also a lesson in human nature that Allah subhanahu wa that uh, al-Ghazali is giving us. So what al-Ghazali is trying to teach us is that at its core, a human being seeks two things. And these two things are competence and character. And you think about competence. These are external knowledge and experiences and insights that we gain over the course of a lifetime, whether it's through a teacher, whether it's through our own self-study, this is competence that we're gaining. Character then shines when a person avoids traits like anger or arrogance or pride and so on and so forth. So external and internal, and to have the ability to unite then means that we must attain competency of insight because we need self-awareness, 
and self-awareness help us helps us also with the study of the Quran and reflecting upon with the messages that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given us. And the character, and that character that we should strive for is piety. So that is an internal facing attribute. So if we combine those two together, it's a pretty tall order. You know, being able to have all this insight and not feeling some kind of pride or arrogance is hard as human beings. We know this. You know, you can take anybody who's a specialist in something, they will take a certain level of pride in their work. But just to say that, you know, I'm going to not let that um, come in the way of me becoming pious, meaning somebody who uh, is more charitable towards others who might not have that skill. That is a struggle that we all have internally. So unfortunately, this arrogance of mankind gets in the way of us. So what should we do about it? For starters, we can try and avoid it at all costs by trying to make ourselves aware that shaitan is the first one to, to demonstrate this, this attribute of arrogance. So if you think about when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked Iblis, um, bow down in front of Adam, what was Iblis's response? His response was that he is better than Adam. He is much better because he's made from smokeless fire and Adam was made from clay. That is 100% pure arrogance and pride. And our beloved Prophet ﷺ warns us about this in an authentic hadith, warns us about not getting pride or arrogance into our heart. And he, he says that whoever has a mustard seed's weight of pride or arrogance in his heart shall not be admitted into paradise. And whoever has a mustard seed weight of faith in his heart shall not be admitted into the fire. And this is, an, this is a little bit of a tangent, but it's interesting to me that the mustard seed, is it comes up as an example over and over again to define the most smallest of things. And if you think about how big, or if you know how big a mustard seed is, it's maybe no more than one or two millimeters big. So it's tiny, it's very, very small. But that's the analogy that we find the prophets use when they talk about something that is really small in comparison. So, you know, when the Prophet ﷺ mentioned this, one of the prof one of the companions said, you know, a person loves that his dress and his shoes should be beautiful. So the implication here is that one of the Sahabas was saying, you know, what about, you know, dressing up nicely and having that kind of pride when you or feel good when you dress really nicely, you have nice shoes on. And the Prophet ﷺ replied to the Sahaba by saying, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beautiful and Allah loves beauty. Pride disdains the truth of self-conceit and contempt for the people. So this is solid advice that Prophet ﷺ is giving all of us, that when we engage with pride and arrogance, we are deceiving ourselves. And it is, it is as if you're in an act of contempt towards other people when you feel that level of pride, that you are more superior than others. So this is just a warning, general warning that the Prophet ﷺ is, is giving us through one of these uh, interactions with the Sahaba. So this pride and arrogance is something that we constantly struggle with. And we also have to remind ourselves that our character is not defined by a snapshot in time. So if somebody were to tell me uh, that I am truthful or that I am uh, persevered, I persevere things, for example, those are just moments in time, snapshots of moments in time. Because to continually maintain the level of character that the Prophet ﷺ had, it's a lifetime of struggle. Because at any given moment, we as people, we will make mistakes. And that would then create a new reflection or a new snapshot in time for us. But it doesn't mean that that is exactly how we are. We must always constantly strive. Just like knowledge accumulates over time and grows and makes that insight stronger for our um, competence. Same thing goes with character. It takes time. It takes constant perseverance to keep building it. So instead of getting upset with ourselves, you know, we should always try to combat that feeling. So if somebody were to say, hey, you made a mistake, we should try to say, okay, I'm not going to argue. If it's true, then I'm going to try and do better next time. Otherwise, don't even make it a big deal if it doesn't have to be a big deal. And, you know, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us also in Surah Al-Hujarat, in akramakum in the lahu atkaakum, surely the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous among you. Another way to implement this attribute in our life would be to bring people together. And it could be as simple as encouraging people to pray in congregation, going to the masjid. Salatul Fajr is always one of the hardest prayers to have people show up at the masjid. Maybe even uh, Salatul Dhuhr 
especially Monday through Friday when everybody's working. So to have that encouragement or provide that encouragement is another way that we can we can act on this particular attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and according to our Prophet sallallahu this is also from an authentic hadith that when two or more people pray together, that is considered a congregation. So you don't have to, if you're in a place, uh, let's say your office, and you don't have uh, the ability to go to the masjid, for example, for one of the salahs, finding another co-worker would be a great way to create a congregation uh, in your space. Uh, there's also the added benefit, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the uh, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us in another authentic hadith that when you pray in a congregation, the reward of that salah is 25 times more than if you would have prayed that salah uh, on your own. So another way to also bring people together is to bring people together for a cause for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we recognize the horrible acts that are taking place currently in Palestine, for example. Bringing people for that cause is also a way to act on this attribute from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or to bring people together uh, in somebody's time of need. Somebody may be going through a hardship um, because of perhaps a death in the family, or maybe there's just a financial loss because of some event. That is another way in which we can benefit from bringing people together. Or even commemorating somebody's memory who might be lost in the community is another way for us to benefit from performing those good actions that reflect on this name, al -Jirame. Or simply gather with friends and family for the sake of building community, whether it's you know, a dinner party during Ramadan, or something as simple as, let's all go have tea together. That is a way for us to engage with other people and say something positive and good, because that will then reflect on your actions on the Day of Judgment, inshallah khair. And at present, we live in the world that is highly polarized. I mean, you can't go to any media, it doesn't matter, old media, new media, social media, the relentless portrayal of stories in which people uh, say things to create division is incredible. So this is another time where if we think about this is a test for us to see how can we unite as people? How can we bring ourselves to come together and recognize where we could do better and then rectify it by building a single community as best as we can? So if nothing else, we should find inspiration from this uh, attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-jami, that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can bring all of these disparate things together and create these wonderful systems and many of them we don't know yet about you know and these systems will persist until the end of days and we may never learn about every single one of these systems or these different things you know we can achieve at least one small feat of trying to build bridges between our communities and other communities and inshallah may Allah elevate our understanding of this attribute of the Quran from the seat of the Prophet Sallallahu May we live our lives under the guidance of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and may Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala increase us in knowledge and give us wisdom so that we may have the ability to apply this knowledge when we need it the most. Aqulu kulli haza wa astaghfirullahi wa lakum wa la sa'ir al-muslimin fa astaghfiruhu inna hu ghafurur rahim. My dear brothers and sisters, I seek forgiveness from Allah for me and for you and for the rest of the Muslims. So ask Allah for forgiveness. He is the forgiver, the most merciful. You know, my dear brothers and sisters, I hope you find benefit from this beautiful name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as I was reflecting on this name, I found myself just wondering how many times have I myself been guilty of creating those uh, divisions? It could be something as simple as liking a message where you're making fun of somebody. And in the moment, you may have found it funny, but just that action of liking somebody could have encouraged that same person to take satisfaction in doing something that may not have been good. So I encourage us all to look into ourselves. How can we unite ourselves with our community as best as we can? You know, we are created different. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us this in the Quran. You know, you know, we've created you different. So what, will you learn from each other and will you show patience? You know, it's not, it's not always easy. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the insights so that we can unlock new ways in which we can build communities and build bridges across communities. And may this knowledge benefit us all. And may we continue to live our lives in the way that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And there's nobody else whose approval should matter the most, you know, as we live in this world. As long as we live in this world, we must we must first seek the approval for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we must find opportunities to grow our own competencies in the Quran so that we may then further benefit and share this benefit with others. And our character is not set in stone. Every moment we must decide how we are going to act. How do we want to mold our personal character and in which reflection do we want to find our character in? Is it the reflection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or is it the reflection of what the world is pushing out there today? So we can either choose to tarnish our character in just that one moment, but then find the next moment and clean it up by asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. And that is how we elevate ourselves to do more good deeds, inshallah. Khair. May Allah accept all our good deeds and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide our hearts towards him. I mean, Allahumma ameen. In the Muslimina wal Muslima, wal Mu'minina wal Mu'minina, wal Qanitina wal Qanita, wal Sadiqina wal Sadiqat, wal Sabirina wal Sabirat, wal Khashiina wal Khashiyat, wal Mutasaddiqina wal Mutasaddiqat, wal Sa'imina wal Sa'imat, wal Hafizina farujuhum wal Hafizat, wal Zakirina allaha kathiran wal Zakirat, adda allaha, lahum makhbiratan wa ajrin azimah. ربنا حفظنا من أزواجنا وزرياتنا كرة يوني وجل المتكين إماما ربنا فاغفر لنا زنوبنا وكفر أن سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار رب جل المكين وصلاة ومن زريات ربنا وتقبل دعاه ربنا أغفر لي ولي والدي وللمؤمنين يوم يقوم الحساب ربنا عليك توكلنا وإليك أنبنا وإليك النصير ربنا لا تجعلنا فتنة للذين كفروا واغفر لنا ربنا إنك أنت العزيز الحكيم ربنا زلمنا أنفسنا ولم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنا كنا من اللهم حبيب لنا الإيمان وزينه في قلوبنا وكره لنا الكفر والفسوق والإسيان إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وجنحاء الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعزكم لعلكم تذكرون لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام للمرسلين الحمد لله رب العالمين آمين اللهم آمين